I <laughs> will mention, you know, Chris said all, all these are posted on YouTube. If you subscribe to the YouTube channel, just go in YouTube and if you don't have an account, make an account and you can click on subscribe and you'll get a notice every time the new one is is posted. So if you can't make one and you want to you want to watch it, um, you're welcome to. I, I have never actually watched myself give a tour, so. um, but I know a lot of other people do. We have members all over the place who tell me they watch them all the time. So um, you can you can do that. Um, also, want to mention with those programs coming up, uh, Debbie Hamrit, uh, who's coming. She's phenomenal. She's uh, she used to um, write and edit the Ball Red Book, which is a book that growers use um, that comes out of Ball Seed. She's worked with Farm Bureau for ages. I've heard her give talks about green infrastructure. She's really one of the, the leaders in, in really pushing that in North Carolina and beyond. And um, I think you'll find it fascinating talk uh, and, and really entertaining. She's always she's always great. One of those smartest person in the room kind of kind of people. Um, so that's that's going to be um, fantastic. Um, I'll tell you one that's not on this, that's not coming up until next spring. But I'm, I'm going to, y'all are getting kind of a sneak peek. This has only gone out to a handful of people who traveled uh, with us, uh, with me for the last, over the last couple of years. But we've got a uh, trip scheduled for uh, end of May next year to the UK to visit uh, go to the Chelsea Flower Show and then some other of the fantastic gardens around there, Highgate, um, Sissinghurst, Wisley, um, and go to uh, Churchill's, uh, his, his home, um, Chartwell, uh, and, and see some other, see a lot of private gardens as well. So if you have any interest in that, get in touch with me and I can, I can send you that information. We, we just, just announced that. Send it out on Wednesday. I think out of the, the 28 uh, spots that we have, I think we have about uh, six or eight people already signed up and, and it only went out to people who went to Cuba, South Africa, um, or uh, Italy and France with me over the last three years. So it should be a fantastic trip. All right, into it. Birds, guarding for birds. Uh, this is something that is seems to be always of interest to people. Um, people want to want a garden for birds. I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to show you plants for birds um, for the most part. Most part. Uh, although my personal feeling is you plant a lot of different things and that's the best thing you can do for wildlife in general. Um, I always do this with pollinator plants. Uh, people want things for the pollinators and I, and I always, I give a talk on this. I show them a, a, an image uh, the data from having our pollen uh, analyzed by uh, a lab at Texas A&M, and the some of the highest uh, late rates of pollen in our in our honey when it, that batch of honey when it was was done were um, maples and willows and sumacs, and those are not things people tell you to put in pollinator gardens for the most part. But we have three pages of of different types of pollen in there, and then there's a whole bunch that they couldn't identify at all. And the, the point of showing that is, isn't to tell you to plant a bunch of, of sumacs, but it's that the diversity is what is really uh, important. So planting, there are some plants you can plant specifically for birds, but really what you should be doing is planting a wide variety because there are a lot of different types of birds. They come through at a lot of different times of the year, so they're not all eating at the same time. Uh, you know, I actually knew somebody who used to plant um, River birch, because river birch will often get uh, get aphids. You see how leaves get crinkled on river birch, and and birds love that. During the summer, birds are eating insects. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind. That it's you know there are a lot of different ways um, plants can can attract birds. I'm not going to talk too much about some of the other ways to attract birds. You know, having water out. You know, some some shallow water is really good for birds. If you want them to hang around, they need liquid. They need so they go to areas where there is some of that. Of course, we're in you know the mosquito zone. So it's, if you're doing water, put it somewhere that's right by a hose, so that you can splash new water in there and get rid of the old water really easily. Because you want to keep it. You don't want it to sit because you'll have more mosquitoes. Um, some of the ground dwelling birds love to have some piles of, of brush around there. Not going to fit into most 
uh, suburban landscapes, but if you're like me and you live on kind of the, I live on a dead end, have woods around me, you know, you can do kind of a, a brush pile uh, out there. Um, you know, I, I like to tell people to plant some thorny plants. Birds like to, like to nest in things like pyracantha and some thornier things because the cats keep out of that. And there's another thing, a lot of gardeners are cat lovers. Cats should be inside. Cats kill tens of thousands of birds every year, so um, you know, keep that in mind. Or don't have a cat, get a dog, they're better. <laughs> um, so any, any general questions before we start or anything that people want me to cover? Perfect, I can say anything. <laughs> please everybody. Um, as always, a uh, couple of things, please try and stay out of the beds. I will try and talk in places where Everybody can gather around. I won't, I'll try not to stay out of little narrow places. Um, if you have a different experience or know something um, that, you, that you think other people would like to hear, if you disagree with me, please chip in there. Um, gardens are all different and it's amazing. Plant that I think is easy to grow. I'll talk to somebody else who I think is a better gardener than me and they'll tell me they've never been able to keep it alive and more often vice versa. Um, so, so it's, we're always happy to, to hear. I'm going to start right in here so everybody can stay sitting down and we'll talk right behind you. So, this is one of your best plants for both birds and people because it's pretty. Uh, beautyberry. Um, Calicarpa. This is a Japanese beauty berry, um, but we also have a native beauty berry if you're interested in growing more natives. Calicarpa americana is our native one. Tends to be a bigger shrub, has bigger fruits on there, but still that same uh, glossy purple. I remember the first time I saw beauty berry in fruit, it blew my mind. I did not think there were any plants uh, that, had, that had fruit that looked like this. Um, so there, there are a bunch of species, only a few in, in the nursery trade. You can get our native Calicarpa americana. There's a couple Japanese ones that you see. Um, often the names are confused on them in the trade. Calicarpa dichotoma and Calicarpa teponica. But we also, but there's a whole, there are about 10 of them that grow in Taiwan alone. Some of them get to be 10, 12 feet tall, huge leaves. But almost all of them will have really pretty fruits. Um, I've grown a ton of beauty berries in my life and it's one of the few plants where I have actually noticed the birds eating them. Very, I, I think it's interesting in that let go on by. Um, you know, botanic gardens will grow in a whole bunch of them all, a lot of times close, fairly close together and I've watched. The birds will go through and eat the, all the berries off our American beauty berry. Then they will go to the Japanese ones, Calicarpa, um, Japonica, and Dichotoma. They'll eat all the berries off of those, almost always in that order. And then there's a white fruited form of both types. Then they will hit the white fruit fruited ones uh, of our American, then the white fruited Japanese ones. There's a Mexican one, Calicarpa acuminata, which has really dense clusters of really dark fruit, and the birds just won't touch those at all. So, um, you know, if you do that, you can really have birds over quite a long season eating the fruits on there. Um, I garden more for myself than for birds, so it always bugs me when they uh, eat the fruit, but it really is a pretty plant um, and very easy to grow. Grow it in sun to part shade. The more shade you get, the less fruit production you'll have. Um, flowers are kind of pinky lavender, but they're not terribly showy on most of these. There's, there's a few species where they're a little bit showier, um, like Calicarpa longissima. Good luck finding that one in the trade then. Any questions? Yeah, very, 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 can seed around. Um, you know, if that concerned you, uh, the, Amer the native ones, which will spread as well. Um, they're not native to this area, they're native to a little farther south. But yeah, this is one that can, when you're feeding birds, they can move them around. I mean, that's, yeah. Uh, this has not been a plant that has, that displaces plants in its native habitat. I haven't seen that. But in a garden and, and surrounding, it will, it will spread around for sure. 
This is the Japanese one, and the this American is, one has bigger bears. Coming. This is this is bigger. Um, pretty close to twice the size. As we're walking, we're gonna go buy a pink fruited one of our native one. Um, as we're walking up the path up here, it'll be on the right side. Um, so look for a pink fruited one. It's called Welch's Pink, um, and you'll cut. You can kind of see the size of of the fruit. So. This is one of our native uh, ornamental grasses, uh, Panicum brigatum. This is a, a relatively new selection called Standing Ovation. But most of, of our grasses, ornamental grasses, birds do like. If you let the, the, seed, the flower heads go to seed, the bird, you will get birds eating them. Now it's a little bit harder on some of these smaller ones you can that are real wispy um, if you plant them with other things around that birds can kind of perch on and get them that that helps a lot um, but but really any ornamental grass you're going to have uh, have some good luck with the smaller birds um, somebody who's a better birder than me can do I can do the plants I don't know the birds I just see them eating the seeds um, it's, it's always a great thing this panicum has been is Supposed to be a little more upright, Panicum purgatum um, can flop around a little bit in the garden, especially if it's in rich soils. You know, if you get your soils really good, some of the plants don't like it as much, or if they like it too much, grow too fast and flop over, or lodge, as they say. Um, the standing ovation has been very good um, and great color. You get both the, the blues of some of the best Panicums along with those burgundy and red tints, and you get more of that burgundy as you go into the um, into the fall so the weather gets cooler and cooler. Uh, another great thing with the ornamental grasses, deer don't tend to eat them. So uh, feed the birds, not the deer. But they want sun. They want sun, yes, yes. Um, and uh, you'll find like with birds, birds tend to feed more in sunny spots. Uh, they, they feed more on insects in the in woodland settings, but when they're going out um, Almost all birds, when they're out foraging, they tend to go out more towards where the sunny, sunny areas because there's more food there. There's just less in the shade. Start talking, catch y'all. Okay, next plant on the list is Sinengia salovii. Let's spell that, please. S i n n i n g i a. Hard to do this one. I'm not writing. It. And then salovia. S E L L O V I I. Um, and there are quite a few of these hardy syningias. Uh, the syningias are uh, uh, African violet relatives. They're in the Gesneriaceae family, so they're closely related to African violets. Um, but what's great about syningias is they are one of the best plants we have in the garden for hummingbirds. They, the hummingbirds just seem to love them. Uh, they hit this this one, Salovii. We've got some Arkansas bells and peach melba and different varieties. Different varieties, and uh, they just the number one plant for hummingbirds. If you on a warm sunny day, if you stand up here, you're liable to see hummingbirds. You know, if you're if you just hang out here for 30 minutes or so, you'll, you're liable to see them. I've seen. I counted once. I saw six. On them, not on this. Only a couple were on this one. We have some more at the other end. That's why I keep pointing that way. Um, but but there were a, a half dozen at least, all at the same time, which is pretty good because they, they're territorial and a lot of times they'll chase chase each other away. Um, very easy to grow. They want sun. They'll take some light shade. Uh, Well-drained soils. Um, super easy to propagate. This one, Salovii, really spreads. There's there are other ones. That are bred with Sinengia tubiflora, which is one of the uh, spe another species that comes from a big uh, corm or tuber-like uh, uh, structure that can get really big. Um, those don't tend to spread quite as much, um, but we'll we'll also uh, make big patches. But because they're a, a African violet relative, basically everything in that family is really easy to root. So sticking a little piece of of the stem um, and keeping it moist, generally you can get a plant to root but great for hummingbirds. I saw a shadow, I was hoping there was a hummingbird. Butterfly. No, nope. that's, not, that's, that's, that's a dragonfly. dragonfly. <laughs> um, okay, you know, usually I'm trying to show plants that are, you know, really at their peak ornamentally, um, but, but you see right here, 
we have a Rudbeckia that has gone past peak. It's really mostly finished flowering. Still got a few flowers on there. Um, and, and this is where, you know, sometimes our, uh, you know, our kind of OCD tends, gardening tendencies and our, our um, you know, bird loving tendencies collide, you know. A lot of people look at this and say, it looks pretty shaggy, need to cut it back. In fact, uh, it wouldn't have been here probably, perhaps right now, except for uh, Tim uh, saw me looking at this and asked if it was going to be on the tour because he was going to, you know, have it cut back today. Um, so, uh, but if you're trying to garden for the birds, you got to leave those seed heads. That's what on, on a lot of these plants they're eating. So, Rudbeckias, anything in the, the daisy family, um, pretty much birds will eat the, um, the seeds on there, but you have to leave them up. Uh, over, you know. Do you, know. do you know about bee balm? Bee balm? Because it, it has a big seed head too. Yeah, bee balm. I'm not sure if, if birds eat Monarda or not. Anybody know? Mm -hmm. I don't know right off. Um, I think it's the bees that like Monarda because it's yeah. in the, the mint family and the bees love the mint. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't, I don't, I'm trying to think, I can't think of other things. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Coneflower. Hmm? Coneflower. Well, coneflower, yeah, that's in the daisy family. So anything like, uh, Shasta daisies, coneflowers, uh, rudbeckias, coreopsis, anything. Thistles. Hmm? Thistle. Thistles. Thistles are great. <laughs> um, goldenrods. Uh, a lot of these, a lot of these meadow type plants are really good for birds. So you know, you, you plant your grasses and your your rudbeckias and things like that together, and have a really good spot for the birds. And you just leave them up, and you know, once the once the birds have eaten all the seeds out of there, these will look you know pretty bare and empty. But you have to leave them up for a while because right now while there are a lot of insects out most birds the bulk of their diet is insects lots of protein it's what they need to get ready for winter for whether they're migratory birds and they need to to bulk up for for travel or if they're even they stay around you know for the cold winters they need to form insulation so really it's it's almost all insects right now so you have to leave these up until it gets cold and the insects aren't around and the birds are uh, eating the, the, you know, looking for other sources of food. But even a lot of those birds that we think of as seed eaters will eat a lot of, um, of insects at this time of year. Any questions? I didn't really talk about Rudbeckia. I really wanted to talk about, you know, how to, how to garden with it, but lots of sun. If you pretty much cut them down, you can uh, tie them in a, uh, in a cluster and hang them on a tree branch or whatever, and the, the goldfinches will still come by and eat the seeds. That's a great idea. Tie them up in the tree. You got to make sure they're they've gotten completely right. Um, but once that happens, yeah, that's that's a that's a great idea. There you go. Be OCD and feed the birds. <laughs> that's probably what I would do because you know all that stuff you leave up over the winter for the birds. I get such great joy in cleaning up my beds in the fall and getting everything ready for winter. You know, getting it cleaned up. I really that's. One of my favorite things in gardening is 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 that kind of shutting it all down. Not that it shuts down really for us, but uh, certainly not here. But at home, you know, I like that. So it's a good good thought because I don't leave the things up for the birds. What does OCD mean? Obsessive compulsive. Um, any uh, any other questions or comments? Okay. A weed? <laughs> mulberry weed. Mulberry? They call it mulberry weed. It's not a mulberry. I don't know I Latin it. on it. Yeah, it's, it's awful weed. Yeah. They're cultivating it and they're saving seeds and they're going to share them. I'm joking. <laughs> I just moved into a house where my neighbor had gotten plants from the arboretum and shared and uh, I'm going to be fighting that for a while. Uh, <laughs> does happen unintentionally all right it's another of our natives uh, this is viburnum nudum uh, viburnum nudum sometimes called smooth with rod uh, which I don't know what a with rod is it was something at some point um, but it's a or possum paw viburnum there you go you gotta read our sign but viburnum nudum you know it that way this is a, a really pretty uh, uh, native viburnum. Get white flowers in spring, little cl flat clusters of white flowers, not, not really fragrant or anything like that. 
Uh, but then when the fruits ripen, they go from almost white to pink to a really pretty robin's egg blue, then to a dark blue black. So you get this whole range of, of color over the end of the season. And the birds love these, these fruits. Often they'll get them while they're still in that pink and light blue stage. But even after they dry, they'll come through and, um, and pull them off during the winter a lot of times. Uh, Viburnum nudum grows as a multi-stem shrub or you can uh, limb it up into a small tree like this. Uh, they can get to be pretty large. I've seen them as large as about 12 feet tall. Um, but you can cut them back and, and rejuvenate them if, if you like. Uh, don't have a lot of diseases and problems. They, go, they grow uh, in uh, kind of damp areas typically, but they're I wouldn't say, I wouldn't call them a drought tolerant plant, but they'll grow in dry soils. Um, but they're also perfectly happy in an area that gets occasional, um, occasional flooding inundation. Uh, really sun? easy to grow. Sun? Sun, they will grow in, in a fair amount of shade. You just like with most things, flowering and fruiting is reduced when you get in shade. It tends to be a little more open, tends to stretch a little bit more. Um, it's a prettier plant in, in full sun. Um, is it evergreen? No, it isn't. It's, uh, there's, when you go along its range, it tends to go from kind of tartily deciduous, like it drops its leaves late to just being typically deciduous. Um, you can get some okay fall color on there, but not every year. Um, some years is, are better than others. There are a couple of named varieties. Some are supposed to have better, better fall color or better fruiting or whatever. Uh, it does tend to fruit better if you have a couple of them. Um, most anything fruits better if you have more than one of it. Any questions? Do most viburnum have fruit like this? Do most viburnums have fruit like this? All viburnums have fruit something like this. Uh, some of them it's more, it's a little bit flatter and red. Some it's dark black. There's a couple where it's just incredible glossy metallic blue um, they're not always round sometimes they're flattened but you, you get uh, a seed uh, fruit with one seed inside so I guess they're technically droops right. and to birds like most of the you know I, I could see how this would be really attractive to birds but most of viburnum fruit would be attractive to birds yeah I think I would think most of uh, viburnum fruit would be attractive to birds uh, some of them there isn't much flesh on the outside of the seed. You have a single seed in there. Some of them is really just kind of that, that uh, colorful cut covering over the seed. Those are probably less uh, attractive. These are pretty nice and um, have, have a fair amount of fruit in them. Are they propagated cuttings or seeds? Either. Yeah. So the viburnums that I perceive as the evergreen are just totally deciduous? No, I'm only speaking like of viburnum nudum. There are evergreen viburnums. Which are totally different. Totally different thing. Viburnum utile, viburnum retidophyllum. Um, yeah. What fruit will they fruit and be attractive for birds? They will fruit, and I, I think most are, are attractive yeah. for birds. Certainly, viburnum, the leatherleaf viburnum, viburnum yeah. retidophyllum is attractive for birds. Um, Viburnum tinus is the, the Loris tinus. About like the chindo. Um, chindo viburnums. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we get they they don't tend to go after them quite as heavily as some of the other plants, but uh, certainly uh, when those fruit well. So you can pretty much guarantee that if you eat it, birds are likely to be interested in it. So you know, if you have a little patio apple like this little guy over here, this little columnar apple, or figs or blueberries uh, you know there's a good chance that that birds uh, will be interested in eating them just like you they're going for the sugars and and carbohydrates in there to, to bulk up so uh, that's always a, a good um, assumption you know figs especially it seems like uh, I always tell people the figs that they can get to try and get to keep the birds off of them but you know if you got enough space you can plant some plant enough out you know let the birds have them it's it's certainly, uh, they like them. Everybody likes birds until they're eating the things you want to eat. Right. You know, blueberries, birds love blueberries. <laughs> you can put a net over some of them and leave one out. Um, you know, I'm not gonna really, I mean, figs are pretty easy. Uh, 
a whole bunch out there. There's very few in the trade, but there are, there are just bunches and bunches of them that uh, you know be good to get in and, and try in the southeast. Uh, they've mostly been um, bred for hardiness, but if you get one that's zone seven hardy, it doesn't really matter if it's um, if it'll go into zone six, zone five. Um, and they they love those fruits just before they get ripe. You know, right before you're going <laughs> to pick them. <laughs> This is a, a holly, Ilex purpurea. This is called the, the peach leaf, plum leaf, peach leaf holly. Um, and hollies, we know they're all, they're good for birds. Um, you do need a male and a female to get good fruit. Although if you live kind of out, um, you know, in a more wooded area, a lot of times we have native hollies out that'll, that'll pollinate it. Usually you want one male per eight or 10 female um, plants is, is gonna be good enough. And, when they fruit, they're they're um, they're always uh, the birds go after them. Um, there are tons of different hollies. We have deciduous hollies, the winter berries. Uh, the birds really go after them. A lot of the cedar waxwings, especially, really like those those out there. We have um, other uh, big tree type of uh, hollies like this one. We have our native um, ilex opaca and our inkberry ilex glabra. And uh, this really that's a there's a just hundreds of hollies to choose from and you can find one just about for any spot in the landscape they're little dwarf ones big tall ones um so if you really want tree you know birds you know bringing a couple of hollies is a is a good way to do it um this is a smooth leaf one down here um if you if you know what uh peach looks like you can see where it gets that name peach leaf holly uh if I like planting out the spiny leaf ones for birds because, again, that tends to keep some of the, you know, cats and things like that away from them if they're they're out there. Um, all of them prefer sun in, in, if you want to get a really dense growth, but a lot of them will tolerate quite a bit of shade. Um, naturally, most of the many of the hollies are shade plants. They grow as understory trees. Think of our own um, native hollies, uh, American hollies. How those are. Uh, so when you're getting hollies, if you're getting the main selections, like say you're getting a deciduous winterberry holly, you know, make sure you're getting a pollinator, a male, that flowers at the same time as the female. Some males pollinate some females, some don't. They, they've got to have kind of a crossover with, um, with pollination. Now something I always get asked about with, with uh, hollies is, you know, my hollies didn't fruit this year. What's going on with them? And uh, hollies tend to fruit heaviest every other year. Like a lot of fruiting plants will be a heavy year and then a lighter year. But, in, but what is often the issue is there's a limit, limited time while they're flowering. You have, you have a couple of weeks while they're flowering. And if you get a lot of rain or get a lot of bad weather during that period, you know, in the spring uh, when they're flowering, the bees aren't visiting them. It's as simple as that. If the bees aren't visiting them, they're not going to get uh, pollinated. So it's it's a lot of times the the weather effects from a whole different time of year. You know, right now you're thinking, well, I got no berries. You forget that you know you had three weeks of of rain and cold weather. Uh, you know, when the hollies were flowering. So a lot of times that's the case. Generally. The solution is to wait till next year, maybe plant another pollinator if you don't have a good pollinator, but not a whole lot else you can do. Um, people often ask me the heaviest flat fruiting ones, like for the winter berry, say. And I gotta tell you, I, we, I had a collection at another garden of winter berries. We had about, um, oh, I don't know, 30 or so different varieties of, of the deciduous hollies uh, planted out. And I'd go out there and I'd be like, that's it. That's the plant. That's the best one. Now I got one to recommend. It's loaded with fruit. I think it was good last year. And I jot it down and go out the next year and it wouldn't look very good. And there'd be another one that was fantastic. And, and for 10 years I looked at them and there's a lot of good ones. Uh, and it's it's really, it's hard to pinpoint what's the best one. Best idea is to plant several, plant different ones, plant some different, a couple of different males and have extended blooming because it seemed like every year there's one or two that were just knock your socks off and then other years maybe not so much um so uh so that's kind of the best we've got one that uh we got from a a, a big nursery um of, of some evaluation plants that i think it's on the market now is berry poppins 
but it does seem to fruit very well. This Ilex purpurea, I believe this is male. I haven't looked at the flowers, but we haven't had breeding on it that I can remember. Chris, do you ever understand? I, th I think it's a male, but I don't know. While we're here, I'll point out a couple of other things. Ligustrum, great plant for birds, but probably not one you want to plant for birds because it is such a it can be such a weedy plant, especially the uh, Ligustrum sinensis types. Um, you know, so. But, you know, birds do love it, but you probably want to stay away from it. Another one, um, cherry laurels. Uh, they don't always fruit for us, but, but birds do like those, those fruits uh, when it does fruit. Um, so, you know, there, there, there are other plants in there, but like somebody mentioned with the calicarpa, you do have to be careful. You have to think about where you live. Um, you know, ligustrum's probably just fine if you're, if you're living not too far from here. It probably ain't going to do anything. It ain't going to spread anywhere. I live, like I said, by a wooded lot. I probably wouldn't do ligustrum in my, my garden. That looks boring. I, I got better things to plant. <laughs> um, but you know, yeah, you gotta you gotta think about those things. But the cherry laurel is not like that, is it? Cherry laurel doesn't spread around now. Yeah. Yeah. Too far at all. Roses. We tend to cut our roses back after they finish flowering. Um, don't think about them as as um, bird plants. Uh, but they have really the rose hips um, are a lot of birds will go after the rose hips. Um, you know, some some fruit better than others, but you can see the the hips starting to form here. Uh, so you can't cut them back if you want the the birds to, to eat them. Um, you also can't spray your roses within an inch of their life if you want to. You know, if you're thinking about birds and insects and that sort of thing. So um, don't want to spray them a whole lot. But there are some um, the we used to have a lot of birds would go into big plantings of Rosa rugosa, the rugose rose. The, it's got really super thorny stems, kind of an upright cane type habit. Um, birds would nest in there, birds would uh, feed on there. They, they, uh, they seem to really like that because they're pretty well protected from just about anything, including people in, in those, uh, those kind of things. But, um, when you get into the, the hybrid teas and floribundas, the heavily uh, hybridized things, they tend to have uh, get less of the hips on there. You're better with plants that are either species or um, closer to the, the original species. Uh, you tend to get more for the hips. And you really want ones, there's some of these hybrids, and I can't remember with these if they'll redden up or not. There are some that just never seem to turn red, orange, or red, or yellow even. They just stay green, and I've never seen birds eating those. So you do want one that's, um, that's going to you know, get really pretty uh, rose hips on it. Typically, when I mention dogwoods, people think of our native um, dogwood tree, our flowering dogwood, Cornus Florida, but there's also a whole slew of shrubby dogwoods that are out there. Um, this is Cornus alba. This is one of the cultivars, Reg Znam, or something like that, but it's sold as Red Gnome. Um, it makes a nice little shrub. It's clusters of, it's a flat clusters of small white flowers, um, followed by uh, blue fruits on, on this. Um, don't really have fruiting on here. Uh, you can see where they kind of would be. This is a would be a, a fruit head. Looks like they weren't pollinated for whatever reason. But these shrubby dogwoods are great for, for birds. They really like them, uh, like the fruit on there. And this is a plant that really gives you a lot great um, winter interest. Not a lot of our, our, our plants um, necessarily do that. Uh, when it gets cold, drops its leaves, the stems will turn really um, nice bright red on this. Um, if you go in and at the end of the winter, or uh, every few years at least, go in and cut out about a third or a quarter of the oldest, thickest stems. It'll keep it rejuvenated and you'll keep fresh stems, the brightest colors on the youngest growth. If you don't care about flowers and fruit, you can cut them back to the ground every year once they've gotten established. Let them uh, re-sprout, grow for the season, and then you'll have those fresh uh, one-year stems um, uh, every year. Um, I, I, I prefer to, to keep it up and just, just selectively prune out every, every year uh, a little bit of it. But they're great. Uh, they'll, they'll tolerate most soils. They'll grow where it's very, very damp. They, most of these shrubby dogwoods are native to wet, low spots, so they're, they're fine planted in those areas. They will tend to sucker and spread out a bit. Um, so they kind of colonize, but, but uh, really nice. 
and you know during the summer this time of year they kind of fade away you got lots of other stuff going on but picture yourself walking into this rose garden from where we did uh, you know during the winter and you've got the wall and then this mass of beautiful bright red stems on either side it'll be really really pretty and they're dense enough and full enough that they act as a you know a visual barrier even even when they're deciduous so I really I really like them for that that effect I usually prune them in late winter because I want the nice red stems, so I don't want to thin them out then. But you can really do it any time after they drop their leaves. You can you can thin them out, um, but I, I I do it late season. This is a a pollinator uh, research that's being done by uh, some folks in the Department of Horticulture, um, and you know so these are beds that were planted for pollinators, for bees and and other pollinators. But what you see is you get a lot of the, it's a lot of overlap between the two. A bird, a good bird garden is usually a good pollinator garden, and vice versa. Everything in here from like these uh, oryngiums are great. The the rudbeckias, the grasses, the Joe pie weed, um, the Ophelia. I don't know about that. Um, good for pollinators though. But you know you will get a lot of the same types of things, the same types of plants. Uh, Okay, here we have a Sambucus, um, elderberry, Ooh, I almost forgot the, the common name. Uh, elderberry, uh, this is one from Taiwan, Sambucus formis, or Javonica, used to be Formosana. Um, little suckering plant, little flat clusters of white flowers, followed by uh, red fruits. Really showy uh, when it's in, in fruit. There are other elderberries. There, we have native elderberries. There are European ones, um, uh, and they, they either have red or black fruits, but either one the birds really like. Uh, they tend to be more shrubby plants. Not all of them do. The European ones don't necessarily do great for us uh, here, especially like the gold leaf ones. There are a lot of you know, gold and variegated and whatever, but the purple leaf ones tend to grow well. They don't stay very purple, but they, they grow well for us. Um, this does fantastic. Uh, Actually, we planted it and it spread so quickly we thought it was going to be a problem, but it kind of has stopped uh, spreading too quickly now. Still need to do a little bit of cleaning up now and then. You, you tell me I'm wrong, it had to stop. Y'all are just taking care of it? Every year we cut it back. Yeah. Dig it out. But that's to keep it contained. But it, does, it, it doesn't run off real far. It stays. It... What type of soil? What type of soil? Any soil. Any soil. Yeah, I don't think I don't think you can stop it. They'll do wet soil too. Oh yeah, they they grow naturally in wet spots. Yep. Um, but I expect this one does. Other sambucas tends to be more you know mesic, kind of low, uh, not swampy soils, but not regular soils. So the the our native ones and the European ones, you want to give those a pretty nice soil and keep it uh, relatively moist when it gets hot and dry. Um, but the fruits are fantastic on there. There's some people who grow. Um, elderberries for the fruits themselves. That's probably another case of you got to fight the, the birds uh, to, to get the actual fruits on there. Um, has anybody ever had elderberry berries? Oh, yes. You like it? Not yeah. In Vermont. We made elderberry jelly. Yeah, see, that's what you do. You put a lot of sugar in, in most of these fruits <laughs> and they're great. Eat elderberries off the, the plant. Uh, Not so much. Tongue. Yeah. <laughs> Questions? Thoughts? All right. Well, that was it for for the tour. Um, there, there. You know, that just scratched the surface. We walked by a million great uh, bird plants out here, and you know, even some of our weeds, pokeweed, great bird plant. Uh, uh, even those natives sometimes are weedy. But thank y'all. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.